法定人数咧系召开我哋保安事务委员会嘅会议。Welcome to the meeting. Item one. Information paper issued since the last meeting. Ms. Elizabeth Quartz and Ms. Ste Mrs. Stephen Ho wrote two letters to the panel. The relevant departments have given replies. The response was circulated to members of this morning. The second item is briefing by the Secretary for Security on the Chief Executive's 2021 policy address. Members, if you wish to ask questions, please press the button now. Meanwhile, let me invite the administration to come in. And members, please note that we'll be spending about one hour on this Q&A item uh, for the Secretary for Security, followed by the ICAC Commissioner. Ms. Elizabeth Quart, Mr. Stephen Ho, Ms. Alice Mack, Mr. Yu Si Wing, Mr. Long Chi Cheng, Mr. Frankie Yek, and Mr. Christopher Zhang. We'll follow this order. Each member will be given four minutes, questions and answers included. And please make sure you observe the speaking time limit. In a moment, I will invite the Secretary to walk us through the policy initiatives on the security of the Security Bureau in the policy address. The speaking notes have been forwarded to members, so Let's wait till the secretary is ready, and then uh, he will have the floor. Apart from the security chief, we also have Miss Carol Yip, permanent secretary for security, and I'll go through the attendance list later if necessary. I think we, they are all familiar faces. You have the floor now, secretary. Chairman, today I'll brief you on the key measures under the Security Bureau's portfolio in the Policy Address 2021. My presentation will focus on a number of salient points. First, safeguarding national security, including two new legislation enhancing law-abiding awareness of young people. Second, enha enhancing fire safety of aged buildings. Three, attracting talents. And four, enhancing border control capability and facilitating flow of talents within the Greater Bay Area. On safeguarding national security, Hong Kong is an inalienable part of our country. We have the constitutional duty to safeguard national security and the central government enacted the Hong Kong national security law at a critical juncture to plug the loophole of national security in Hong Kong. Order has been restored from chaos. S society has got back on the tra right track. However, there are still a, a small number of criminals lurking about in the community who may endanger national security. We will let them feel the full force of the law. In view of the threat of domestic terrorism, we will remain highly vigilant against lone wolf terrorist attacks and those advocating Hong Kong independence via softer means, such as encouraging inciting terrorist activities. The Interdepartmental Counterterrorism Unit will step up its response capability and take resolute enforcement action. We will step up publicity and public education. And we will also taking forward the enactment of uh, lo local legislation to implement Article 23 of the Basic Law so as to fulfill our constitutional duty as soon as possible. We will make reference to past studies, implementation experience of the Hong Kong National Security Law and relevant court verdict, as well as taking into account the actual circumstances in Hong Kong so as to draw up effective and pragmatic proposals and provisions. We will start the consultation and legislative exercise in the next term of LegCo. In light of increased cyber attacks in recent years, there have been significant security challenges to critical information infrastructure. They may cause even serious harm to the economy, people's livelihood, public safety, and even national security. We must step up cybersecurity to ensure normal operation of the business environment. The government will start preparatory work for the enactment of cybersecurity legislation and will consult relevant sectors and the public on the proposal. To help young people develop positive thinking and law-abiding awareness, the six discipline services and the two auxiliary services under Security Bureau will enhance their youth in engagement work through different activities and modes. The Correctional Services Department CSD will join hands with the police in implementing the Walk with Youth program to enact or enhance the uh, law-abiding awareness of young persons. The CSD is also preparing to establish a youth lab and change lab to strengthen the values, moral and civic education for young offenders and rehabilitated offenders. On enhancing fire safety of buildings, fire safety of aged buildings is a common concern. The Fire Safety Buildings Ordinance was enacted in 2007. The Fire Services Department and the Buildings Department have been sparing no effort in enforcing the law and providing owners of aged buildings technical and financial support, including fire safety improvement works subsidy scheme. However, 
However, some ancient buildings, such as three new buildings, are not properly managed. To further enhance the fire safety of buildings, we'll amend the fire safety buildings ordinance based on the existing mechanism under the buildings ordinance to empower the FSD and the buildings departments to carry out fire safety improvement works for owners of old composite and domestic buildings who have not complied with the requirements of the ordinance and to recover the relevant fees from them after completion of works. We hope to start public consultation next year. On attracting talent, sustainable development of Hong Kong requires a large talent pool. The Immigration Department's Quality Migrant Admission Scheme successfully attracted talents with global and mainland vision to come and make significant contribution to Hong Kong. In 2020, we received close to 4,000 applications and approved 1,700 of them. To tie in with the government's strategy amid global competition for quality talents, the annual quotas of the QMAS will double from 2,000 to 4,000. On enhancing handling capacity of control points and facilitating talent flow in the Greater Bay Area, or GBA, at the Legislative Council meeting of the 24th of March 2021, members present, present gave unanimous support to the government's motion to take forward redevelopment of Hong Kong Port to facilitate connectivity of infrastructure facilities. The two governments have started discussion on the design of the Hong Kong Port area and the implementation of a new clearance mode of collaborative inspection and joint clearance so as to commence construction of the Hong Kong Port building as early as practicable. To facilitate flow of talent, we're actively following up the issue with the mainland authorities for GBA visa endorsement to be granted to business and quality talents traveling to and from GBA. It will facilitate non-Chinese nationals residing in Hong Kong to travel to the Greater Bay Area for business research exchanges and visits. Chairman, I just gave a summary of our work and we'll be happy to take questions from members. Thank you. Thank you. Secretary. The floor is now open. Dr. Uh, Ms. Elizabeth Kwan. Thank you, Chairman. In paragraph 4 of the policy address, it is said that uh, starting from the uh, next term of Ledge Code, the enactment of local legislation to implement Article 23 of the Basic Law will take place. We still have less than one year to go for the current term of government. So, Secretary, are you confident to complete the um, legislation on Article 23 exercise within this year? And also, I support cybersecurity legislation, but there are other important pieces of legislation to safeguard national security, such as combating fake information, inciting hatred, and insulting public officers. Especially on the offense of insulting public officers in recent years, the situation has become even more serious, especially in relation to senior inspector of the police force, Ms. Lam, on the internet. There were extensive um, cold-blooded uh, comments. Now that uh, we have uh, the offense of doxing requiring uh, the uh, such comments uh, to be taken off the net, uh, including the offense of voyeurism, we can take away uh, inappropriate content. But for the comments in relation to insults on the public officers, I hope that uh, we can work on it as soon as possible. Next, about the question of Falun Gong. I mentioned in the council before that uh, for some anti-China organizations, they should be phased out as soon as possible. However, I understand for Falun Gong, they are still active in Hong Kong. What are you going to do about these organizations? Secretary. On legislating on Article 23 of the Basic Law, we hope uh, to take up this task as quickly as possible. However, I urge members to understand that this is no simple task. We are not enacting an old piece of legislation. What happened in 2003 it would just serve as a starting point. In the past 20 years, a lot has happened in Hong Kong. From June 2019, there had been the black clad violence and incidents of endangering national security, including acts of sedition and uh, collusion with foreign forces. They are not confined to the four offenses set out in the Hong Kong national security law. There are seven offenses under Article 23, and we should legislate on these offenses. In 2019, we um, Incidents happened, and in light of these incidents, we need to devise different scenarios and get prepared for these scenarios and see whether the existing legislation would cover these events. Otherwise, we need to draw up new um, offenses, and uh, we will need to come up with an, a targeted piece of legislation to tackle these issues. 
We hope to complete con uh, or to kickstart consultation before the end of this term of government. In relation to fake news and incitement of hatred and insulting public offices, I understand that the chief executive has engaged the Home Affairs Bureau to conduct a study on these three issues. We will provide full support. We understand that legislation is one viable option. We believe these three are important matters because circulation of fake news and incitement of hatred actually uh, sparked the incidents in 2019, and many young people were then incited to take to the street and engage in illegal acts. As for insulting public officers, all law enforcement uh, officers find their jobs more difficult in the face of insults, so we need to work on that as well. As for Falun Gong, I don't think I should comment on a particular organization. Action will be taken in terms of breach of any laws, including the Hong Kong national security law. We'll definitely take swift enforcement action. Mr. Stephen Ho. First of all, I need to appreciate the Security Bureau's work on safeguarding national security. In terms of uh, a shift of mindset, at least I am seeing a change in government bureaus and departments now. Uh, at least I understand that uh, as far as resources are concerned, time may be needed for their redeployment. Now, in terms of uh, social developments, especially the political incidents in 2014, 2019, the anti-China forces uh, wreaked havoc in our society, and the Hong Kong SAR government and the police, uh, Marine Police, some of the Marine Police force were deployed to take up uh, on land duties. However, at the same time, the Hong Kong waters are vast, and for a long time there haven't been sufficient resources for uh, the Marine forces. Uh, hence, uh, smuggling has become more and more serious, especially, um, well, as you may have seen in online footages, sometimes you have 40, 50 people smuggling um, goods on the waters of Hong Kong, and there are so many ways they could plug loopholes in the laws of Hong Kong. We must come back smuggling at sea, and the government has recently stepped up its effort, uh, for example, by confiscating speedboats used in the smuggling activities. However, at the same time, I'm concerned about illegal fishing in Hong Kong waters. In fact, before Mr. Tang became bureau chief, we already spoke to him about the insufficient tackling of illegal fishing in the waters of Hong Kong since 2012. After enacting a piece of legislation, you need to support the law with resources. In fact, recently, I've received calls from a lot of fishermen um, in on the eastern side of Tai Po. There were dozens of boats practicing illegal fishing, and when Marine police patrolled past the location, they would only be chased away, and the situation lasted for over a decade without improvement. So, Commissioner, is it possible to step up effort in terms of smuggling at sea instead of just chasing uh, those uh, illegal fishermen away? Chair, uh, Mr. Stephen Hill raised two issues, especially um, smuggling on sea. During the pandemic, the situation has gone worse because of um, embargo or, um, or um, suspension of flow from, of goods from the mainland. Um, smuggling activities have worsened. We have conducted joint operation across the border with um, our counterparts, and there have been interdepartmental joint operations to deal with the um, smuggling activities. Recently, we have cracked down on cases. We have um, arrested uh, criminals on land, seizing cargoes of frozen meat, which is um, safer. We have been working with the AFCD to uh, crack down on illegal fishing. 
between the first uh, nine months this year, we have carried out um, more than 114 joint operations to arrest um, illegal immigrants. We arrest them for the offense of illegal immigration. We understand the impact of illegal fishing on the livelihood of local fishermen. Uh, that's, why, that's why we um, have enhanced our efforts. So you have only caught 11 people. I saw more than 100 illegal fishermen at one night. I'm afraid that um, given your current efficiency, um, the, public's con you, uh, the public will lose confidence in you. Mr. Stephen Ho, you have raised the issue many times. It is not an easy task. You have to give the authorities some time. Ms. Alex Mack. Chair, in the policy address, you see mentioned that um, the government would enhance cyber security and uh, security of data. Criminals publish messages which incite hatred and in, uh, inciting violence on the internet. A police officer died during the line of duty, but there were people dis dispersing messages of hatred online. We also note that um, commercial bodies um, like TVB made a report to the police. Their clients are being attacked online. It's no difference with having triad members um, scaring people off from shops. So do we have the legislation to deal with these behaviors? Have there been operations carried out on this? On cyber security, will we have legislation targeting disbursements of um, false information online or information or messages inciting hatred online or messages which would disrupt normal business behavior, like the TVB case. Secretary, Chair, Ms. Mack mentioned two issues. First, the upcoming cybersecurity legislation. It mainly concerns infrastructure for individuals engaging in Ill illegal behaviors online, for example, bullying, incitement, or intimidation online. Currently, we have legislations to deal with these. For example, for criminal intimidation, we have such an offense. And we also have Section 9 and 10 uh, under the, uh, the Crime Ordinance um, to tackle spreading of um, hate messages. However, there are still loopholes. That's why we are reviewing the law to deal with gray areas with uh, the crime ordinance. The Law Reform Commission is also conducting a review on cybercrime. So the Law Reform Commission has uh, is aware of the situation and it is reviewing uh, whether new legislation is required. Secretary, I hope that the Ledger Code would be consulted on the new laws so that we can have the adequate tool to tackle these uh, crimes. And also in, the, in your report, you said we need to enhance the law abidingness of young people. In the past few years, The sense uh, the law abidingness um, among people has been destroyed. I know that um, disciplinary services are helping to enhance the law abidingness of young people. I totally support that. We have to let young people know more about the work carried out by disciplinary services, and also activities should be held to rebuild young people's sense of law abidingness. During the black clad violence, young people, some young people were incited to commit crimes and are sentenced to jail. As we, pe as we speak, there are still people 
supporting these prisoners and glorifying um, their imprisonment. I hope the Secretary and the Bureau can do more to foster a positive value among young people. Please note Ms. Alice Max's point. Ms. Le Mr. Leung Ji Chang. Thank you, Chair. I have to thank the Secretary, uh, the Security Bureau, and the Six Disciplinary Services for the contribution to restore Hong Kong from chaos to order. I have always been concerned about um, our security since the previous um, Secretary for Security, Hong Kong security level has been on the medium level. The Secretary is telling us that there are still anti-China destabilizing forces lurking around. And also we have to guard against long wolf attacks. So the Secretary, in assessing our security level, security risk level, uh, would you consider adjusting the level? Or can you tell the public clearly uh, that we are still at medium risk? Another question about um, attracting talents. Recently, applicants under the Quality Migrant Admission Scheme has surged to 4,000. That's why you have increased the uh, quota number from 2,000 to 4,000. So did you adjust the quota according to the number of application rather than an estimation of the future trend? Does it mean that your estimation on the future trend of um, applicants is inaccurate? On the first question, we are still at the medium security risk. That means we. Uh, that uh, it means that um, it is possible that we are subject to an attack, but there is no evidence that we will be a target. For high security risk, it means that there is evidence that we are likely to become the target of an attack. For example, um, if we have evidence that um, there is a threat of attack on public transports like an MTR, then we have to take action. Say if someone um, announced an attack on the MTR system, then we will step up security check um, at MTR stations. These measures would affect the livelihood or daily life of, the, of our people. That's the high risk. Medium risk level doesn't mean that we don't have any measures in place. Although there is no specific intelligence showing that we are the target of an attack, we will be ready in terms of intelligence gathering and deployments to make sure that we can deal with such an attack. On quality migrant submission scheme, we have a committee on that. The, com uh, the committee comprises representatives from the SB, the, Law Welf the Labor and Welfare Bureau, and other departments. On deciding whether we need to introduce more talents to Hong Kong, well, um, more than half of our members have experience in different fields. And we need a lot of talents on uh, financial services and, uh, eco and, and, the, and um, economics. That's why we are introducing a lot of uh, these talents. Mr. Frankie Yick. Paragraph 8 mentioned that the government would like to enhance young people's law abidingness. Of course, we support that. But it seems that it doesn't, the situation doesn't um, confine to young people. There are lots of um, vehicles for hire without um, a valid license. There are many people doing that, and this is illegal. And the drivers are 
committing an offense knowingly. On the other hand, members of the public still use their services, even they know that um, there will not be um, insurance. So it shows that as a whole, the law abidingness in Hong Kong is weak. So I wonder how the government would enhance people's law abidingness as well as ta uh, tackling the problem of um, unlicensed vehicles for hire. How can we tell people that um, by supporting these uh, illegal surface, um, they are subject to uh, danger? On law enforcement, um, there are many. You mentioned um, the part law enforcement agencies are using big data and um, technologies to um, assist law enforcement. On road traffic law enforcement, I wonder why the transport the uh, transport department is not using CCTV installed um, at um, interchanges for law enforcement. What are they waiting for? On quality in, on quality migrants admission, what about um, people in certain occupations? I'm told by people that they have a hard time hiring truck drivers and mechanics. It is really dealing a blow to our economy. So you mentioned a committee on quality migrant emissions. Uh, so please do something because we are um, heading on the front. Now, I've noticed that um, for the IPCC, uh, which I have been serving as a member, we have received a lot of false complaints. It wasted a lot of resources to carry out analysis and investigation. The police has been very lenient on these false complaints. I think you have to deal with the issue head on to remind the public of the dire consequence of making a false complaint and not to waste uh, public resources. Thank you. On um, unlicensed vehicles for hire, we would definitely enforce the law. These include Uber. We have carried out many operations in the past. We are still carrying on with the effort on smart law enforcement. Transport departments and other departments are making use of smart devices to assist in law enforcement. This is the trend. We are working with different departments to explore how we can gain access from uh, gain access to different to information um, from different departments to enhance law enforcement. On quality migrants admission, um, truck drivers are needed. There are many plans uh, to introduce um, talents. The quality migrants admission program is just one of them. I think um, some programs would be applicable to your situation. On complaints to the IPCC, we attached a lot of importance to complaints made to IPCC. There have been successful cases. However, in terms of evidence collection, um, it is challenging. However, we would definitely um, tackle on false uh, complaints. Thank you, Secretary. On um, unlicensed vehicles for hire, I'm, I just want to remind the public that if an accident happened, the passenger will not be able to get uh, compensation. I'm just trying to urge people not to support illegal uh, services um, for convenience. Mr. Christopher Chang. Chairman, I'm also concerned about enhancing young people's law abiding awareness. Paragraph 8, enhancing the law abiding awareness of young people. I noticed that in 2019, after the emergence of black clad violence, a lot of young people were indoctrinated by the opposition camp. They had total mis distrust in our co country, and they fell for the slogans of um, opposing China and uh, creating chaos in Hong Kong. I think the root of the problem is the education system, and we should reflect on ourselves. Now, since you've assumed office, Secretary, you have shown great resolve and commitment in tackling these issues. 
So it is said here that you have six discipline for services and the two auxiliary services, and you're going to establish or expand your work in youth uniform groups with a view to developing the positive thinking, law abiding awareness, a sense of discipline, and team spirit of young people, and to help them understand their country and uh, enhance a sense of national identity. Now, about uniform groups for young people. May I know that since there are resource implications, there should be limited number of uh, candidates enrolled. May I know how many young people you have recruited? Has the government considered expanding the scope of subsidy? And has the government considered promoting uniform groups so that every school in Hong Kong will be able to participate in uh, in the uh, scheme, and that uh, each year every student should take part in at least one uniform group. Secretary, in terms of law abiding awareness of our young people, especially a sense of um, that national identity, we attach great importance. It is very important, and like Mr. Christopher Chang, we need to. Uh, work with different bureaus, such as the Education Bureau. I understand that a lot has been done on the education front, such as the flag raising ceremony, uh, etc. And we also have a uh, youth cadets for different uh, discipline services. For junior police course, we have 160,000 members with some 4,000 active members. And we also have another scheme with uh, 423. Uh, we have customs, yes. For the Customs and Excise Department, 1,102 candidates. For CSD, we have 174 young ambassadors. And Civil Aviation Department, 3,743. And then uh, for Auxiliary um, Service, uh, 2,147. For groups such as Junior Police Call, we um, rely on the help of schools to uh, promote our scheme and recruit young members. We recruit young people from the age of 6 to 25, covering primary school all the way to universities. Apart from cultivating positive thinking among young people in schools, we have also done a lot in helping persons in custody, especially for young people who are detained because of um, the black cat violence. We have the initiative called Understanding History is the Beginning of College, uh, no, of Knowledge, with a view to promoting moral and civic education for young offenders whilst they're in custody so that we can instill a change in their mindset. Mr. Tony Chair. Chairman. I strongly support the work of the Security Bureau, especially on safeguarding national security, combating domestic terrorism, and enhancing cybersecurity, and fulfilling the constitutional duty of Hong Kong, that is, legis local legislation to implement Article 23 of the Basic Law. I'm in full support of the Secretary's work. Now, I echo what the Secretary said. We need to enhance the law-abiding awareness of our young people, especially young offenders. I appreciate the initiatives in relation to helping young offenders to help them build positive values. I understand recently, Secretary, you had a sharing session for the um, rehabilitated offenders to share the experience. And I think this would help our young people get a better understanding of reality, and I think this is what uh, you should continue to do. Anyway, I have two questions. We're not able to resume cross-boundary travel yet, but in terms of the northern metropolis uh, advocated in the policy address, you have the Northwest uh, Railway and also another um, rail uh, railway line linking Law Wu, Shenzhen, and in terms of co-location arrangement, my question is whether you have begun work, as this involves um, the other government as well. And I have a question on fire safety. As you know, recently, 
there was a major fire in Kaohsiung with 46 casualties. I understand that building had a lot of subdivided units. I hope the SAR government would learn a lesson from that tragedy. I understand that uh, we just passed a legislation on imposing rent control on subdivided units. Uh, I'm disappointed uh, in the bill because it didn't give full consideration to imposing safety or basic safety requirements in buildings with subdivided units. So, Secretary, when it comes to fire safety, please make sure that uh, everyone will feel the full force of the law and that um, you need to be strengthened in your enforcement efforts because it is very hazardous. Just like the Kaohsiung fire uh, I mentioned, it's a matter of life and death. Another point is that since we're not able to travel um, around the world, many people would uh, then resort to uh, outdoor activities such as hiking. And the government has been reminding everybody to be careful. What about waterborne activities? Would you step up uh, your publicity and remind people to be safe? Like. Uh, Secretary, about resuming cross-boundary activities, um, the co-location arrangement will be the primary consideration for future border control points, such as the redeveloped uh, Wonggang port and also the two locations you mentioned. Co-location arrangements would be put in place so that uh, space can be freed up. Also, for Asia buildings, we're going to amend the fire safety buildings ordinance so that for aged buildings on which notice has been served for repair works to be carried out, we can um, mandate uh, repair works and recover the cost later. This will begin next year. About marine safety, the LCST is responsible for beaches. And apart from that, in terms of um, the work of the police and fire safety, Fire Services Department, we also mount um, rescue at sea, and we have relevant publicity work, and we'll continue to step up our efforts. I'd like to follow up on one point, Chairman, Secretary, on building safety. I understand that uh, there will be a local consultation exercise next year for mandatory repair. I am concerned that it may be too late because at the moment, buildings with subdivided units are not properly maintained, and that device and the FSD may not be facing the issue squarely. This is exactly because you haven't introduced basic safety requirements for these buildings. So the subdivided units present a time bomb. The matter is serious. I hope that the enfor law enforcement officers will be more stringent in their enforcement action. Rehousing aside, you must not let anyone live in a, da um, a dangerous uh, dwelling. Mr. Holden Chow, well, I understand that the Secretary is working full steam on local legislation to implement Article 23 of the Basic Law. I hope I'll see some results soon. And about the unfortunate uh, passing away of the um, Senior Inspector of the poli Marine Police, I understand from that uh, officers from other discipline services made uh, cold-blooded, uh, immoral remarks on the internet, and and uh, these officers have been subject to disciplinary action. I think this is necessary, Secretary. My question is on paragraph seven of your paper. This is about uh, your work on enactment of cyber security legislation, and. I think we've discussed this point before on combating fake news. The government should spare no effort and work on it as quickly as possible. My understanding, however, at the moment is that in terms of cybersecurity legislation, more should be done to combat fake news. There are messages 
that can endanger cybersecurity and incite hatreds. Around the world, I see legislation being enacted to forbid such behavior. So in the future, will the Secretary have the same consideration when enacting legislation? That is, the scope of the law should cover information uh, endangering social um, or cyber security as well as um, national security. In fact, I think the, uh, the police recently cracked down on some cases involving terrorism. So I'd like the Secretary to further explain um, his line of thinking. Secretary, I want to stress once again that cybersecurity legislation will be enacted to cover the cybersecurity of critical infrastructure such as utility companies. If their networks are disrupted, this may cause a disruption to their operation, leading to a danger to people's livelihood and harm to the economy. That is why we need to have um, various uh, assessment schemes and drills and enact legislation. Mr. Holden Chow also referred to fake news, cybersecurity, and uh, insulting public officers. And these are three different matters. The chief executive has already tasked the Home Affairs Bureau to follow up these three issues. Of course, the Security Bureau will give the necessary support and device responsive plans is for the Home Affairs Bureau to decide whether legislation is necessary. But I think that this is definitely um, one of the options on the table. Just to supplement, when we discuss fake news and other areas of the information law, I hope you continue to liaise with the Bureau's concern. I think that definitely you can offer your valuable experience for sharing. So I hope uh, there will be proper coordination and communication among Bureaus. Mr. Chan Kim Po, online deception is getting more serious. This is reflected in terms of the total amount deceived and the number of victims. Many victims lost some or all of their money. It's a serious harm to our people, and there are different new ways of online deception. Recently, banks have developed a system and communicated with uh, clients by with a um, verica SMS verification mechanism, and some scammers would do some uh, cut and paste exercise. And then with some uh, means, they resort to uh, plugging this loophole so that they could put fake information in the genuine message sent to customers. And then um, the unknowing customer would then see the, the money in their accounts being transferred away. I wonder if the gov if the police would work on uh, the such cases, because uh, definitely we will be able to stop deception if we if we take proper action. Hey, uh, concerning the MO mentioned by uh, Mr. Chen Kin Po, yes, we um, are aware of that. The police is currently investigating the cases with the. Um, telecommunication services providers to find ways to prevent this from happening. And also, we are stepping up publicity and education to educate members of the public to distinguish between genuine and fake messages. We don't know whether the investigation would review any um, loopholes on our internet services. If so, we we consider legislating for cybersecurity to require telecommunication services providers to be more careful. Secretary, um, cyber scamming or cyber scams are on the rise. I think this is the trend. Does the police have enough 
resources to tackle cybercrime. If not, you uh, feel free to come to the Finance Committee to ask for funding. Last year, the Legislative Council, the Legislative Council approved um, funding for creation of a chief superintendent post dedicated to tackle cybercrime. So we are grateful for that. If necessary, we will come back to LegCo for more resources. Mr. Ma Fung Kwok. Thank you, Chair. The national security law has been implemented for more than a year. On the surface, the situation has um, returned to stability. However, local terrorism is a serious security threat. To tackle that, we have to rely on education and publicity on top of law enforcement so that we so that our young people can be protected from extremism. On the paper, um, Secretary said the six disciplinary services and the two auxiliary services would help organizing activities to enhance young people's law abiding awareness. I totally support that. But does the police have enough resources to allocate resources for this purpose? During the black cloud violence period, the police has recruited some 30,000 uh, special duty constables. However, for smaller services like the government's flying services, they only have 200 members. So do they have the sufficient manpower to educate young people and do they know do they have the skills to do that? On publicity during the black clad violence, there have been a lot of malicious attacks on the work of police as well as boycotts. It seriously damaged the relationship between police and the public. There was even a time when the JPC could not carry out um, its work. So now has the situation improved? Does the police encounter any difficulties when reaching out to schools? Do you have the support of the um, educators on doing that? Thank you, Chair. On youth education, we have um, members from our own disciplinary services um, to do that. We have the we um, have deployed um, manpower internally for this purpose, and also um, the um, we have been working with the different um, uh, bodies like the uh, Youth Aviation Club. Uh, to carry out um, activities. So um, we will allocate uh, resources wisely um, to educate young people. On schools, the police has a community involvement working group. The working group has started its work last September in, li in liaison with um, Association of School Heads, um, PTAs, and so on to discuss the challenges they face and how we can foster a sense of law-abiding awareness. In the past half a year, we have found that it has become much easier for us to reach out to schools. For some cases, the situation has returned to um, the pre-social incidents level. So we are reaching out to schools to promote national security uh, national security awareness and law-abiding awareness. Our PPRB colleagues are reaching out to schools to share with students knowledge about national security and law-abidingness. We are seeing a very positive development. So are there any difficulties that you have faced? For some schools, um, a minority of them, um, they are still hesitant. We don't expect things to go back to um, go back fully to how it was previously, but uh, most of the schools are very positive. You said they some of the schools are hesitant. So what are they um, hesitant about? Some of them may be hesitant that some students still um, have misunderstanding towards the law enforcement agencies, and some parents are worried that. Um, Police officers going into schools would cause um, 
dis uh, distress. However, uh, with uh, more clarification and more efforts, I think the trend is a positive one. Ms. Ines Yong. Thank you, Chair. I have been supporting the Security Bureau's work. I will continue to do so, especially on the Bureau's work on promoting national security. Paragraph 4, legislation for Article 23. I think we have to step up the pace. You said you would make reference to the um, implementation experience of the NSL and uh, past court rulings. I think that is a good way to go. On this point, will the Security Bureau collate um, court rulings from um, the judiciary and um, compile a collation? Currently, uh, not every case involving national security or a riot has a written ruling. Sometimes the judge would just read out the ruling. Previously, um, the judiciary told us that um, they would not compile a collation on this for this purpose. So with the Security Bureau and the Education Bureau approach the judiciary to ask them single out cases about uh, national security so that the public would be more clear about the bottom line and the punishments on fostering a law abidingness uh, on, on fostering law abiding awareness among young people since year 1974 the JBC has fostered um, a lot of leaders to enhance law abidingness among young people as well as enhancing young people's knowledge about how the police work. So in terms of the uniform for JPC, is the uniform going to be um, redesigned in future? And can the JPC members have their own uniforms? For members who have joined the JPC, How can we foster a sense of um, identity for them? The JPC has one has um, had one million members. Can we invite some um, old members to uh, pass on the experience to new members? And can you work with the um, uh, garrison? Uh, can you can you work with the um, the um, People's Liberation Army in Hong Kong and help young people to foster a sense of law abidingness um, with uniform activities? <laughs> On court rulings, there is only one case which has been completed, and the case is still um, under appeal. So, we will consider past court rulings when legislating for Article 23. I think your suggestion for compiling a collation is um, something we should consider. We are not legal experts, however. We will work with the DOJ to sort out the issue. On young people's law-abiding awareness, the JPC members have their own uniform. So I hope we can further promote um, the JPC's activities. For graduated members, because our members will graduate at the age of 25, we have a JPC fellow for graduated JPC members. The old members would be brought together to uh, carry out a public service and um, share the experience. Dr. Priscilla Lang, Chair on the law abiding awareness of young people or society as a whole. I have a question for the Secretary. According to information, Leung Kin K and Lo Kin Man will have completed their term of imprisonment in January and April next year. In June 2019, when Joshua Wong was released from prison, he immediately called on a siege on police stations and the police headquarters. So it seems that um, once we stop 
the other side will take advantage. For influential figures released from prisons, do we have a way to deal with them? Well, it seems that they are still very, very influential. We have only returned to stability on the surface because of the NSL. What's lurking beneath the surface of the water? Do we know what's happening? That's my first question. Second question. I was in another meeting, so this question might have been asked. I'm very eager to know that prior to the 1st of July next year, that is the 25th anniversary of um, reunification with China, can we discharge our cons cons um, cons constitu constitutional duty to legislate for Article 23? And also, can we legislate for the highly anticipated um, hatred against the police law? I think we definitely have to legislate against hatred against law enforcement agencies. Whether we should extend the scope to public offices, um, we have to consider that. Um, I think the situations faced by um, different governments um, uh, or civil servants um, are different um, from that uh, faced by the law enforcement agencies. Thank you. Uh, we concentrate on pin, uh, punish, uh, punishments and rehabilitation. For anyone who intends to reoffend the law, including inciting others or um, uh, carry out sedition, we will definitely deal with it seriously whether this person has been in prison or not. On our duty to legislate Article 23, it is our constitutional duty. However, we have to take stock and see how we can effectively deal with what has happened after June 2019. That's why we have to revisit what has happened since June 2019 to see how we can deal with it. There are an additional four categories of offences not being dealt with currently by the NSL. We will carry out thorough study and we will. Um, we have a lot of work to do. We hope we can start consultation before the end of this term of the government on offences against fake news, incitement of hatred, and incitation against uh, uh, against. Um, public offices, um, we will definitely deal with it. And this is definitely the option, and we fully support that. On incitation against public offices, we think we should cover all public offices rather than just uh, disciplinary services. Mr. Wong Kwok Kim, Chair, the uh, paper hasn't mentioned the rather rampant situation of smuggling at sea recently. From video clips online, we see how uh, blatant these activities have been. Recently, um, the law enforcement agencies have stepped up um, operations against smuggling, so they have uh, quieted. They have quieted down a bit. Chasing speedboats at sea is high risk with rather low efficiency. So in our two sets against smuggling, there should be other more efficient ways. For example, uh, crack, cracking down smuggling as source. In Hong Kong, we don't have much, we don't have a high um, export tax. So um, do we have the legislation to stop smugglers from um, coming to coming to us? And is there room to review the legislation? Come on. 
Secretary, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Wong. I agree that in terms of combating sea smuggling, uh, when conducting a chase, we need to bear in mind that safety comes first. So when it comes to combating sea smuggling, apart from marine operation, we also attach importance to tackling the problem at source, namely the financial resources of the syndicates and the storage of the uh, com uh, smuggled goods uh, such as um, chilled meat and also storage of the super speed boats and that is why the CNE department and the immigration department recently has ta have taken uh, relevant enforcement action to stop the uh, crime at source so we enforce the law at sea when uh, safe uh, when the circumstances are safe, and we also confiscate, confiscate the proceeds of these criminal syndicates. We also mount joint operations. Very often, the police and the FEHD would act jointly to inspect cold storage to see if the items are legitimate and the sources can be verified. At the same time, we also have other teams inspecting a um, storage places and uh, looking for speedboats for smuggling, and we have confiscated a few. A few last month, the immigration, the, the director of immigration visited the uh, Guangdong municipal counter uh, government's office to set up an instant liaison mechanism, so that when we have sightings of uh, such speedboats, we can inform our counterparts to stop them. There are other matters relating to, say, the use of technology. We need to make improvements to enhance efficiency, uh, whilst ensuring safety of the frontline officers. Secretary, I asked you another question just now. That is, is there room to review the existing legislation to combat sea smuggling? Yes, we're reviewing that. I understand that for parallel trader shops in Shangshui, in the past they would adopt a labor intensive method. At the moment, the border is closed, and yet they still continue to take orders. As long as you place an order, the other side on the mainland will be able to receive the goods. By what way do they move the goods? We'll take the corresponding action. Next, I'd like to ask a few questions. It's my round, four minutes. Secretary, just now, some members expressed grave concern. They would like to see the, pa the enactment of legislation on Article 23 as soon as possible. The other point is about insulting public officer. This, I think we have a consensus on this proposed offence. And next, Secretary, I'd like to discuss law and order situation with you. About two weeks ago, in Taipo Lamchun, five village houses were burgled consecutively. And last week, a group of burglars committed burglary in a, a number of village houses in Yunlong, and um, video footage showed that they were blatant as they left uh, the village. And uh, there were some other burglary cases recently. It seems that the security in remote areas isn't sufficient. I understand you have village patrol teams in rural districts, and police officers would ring the uh, chair of rural committees and village representatives if they identify irregularities. I'd like to tell you, Secretary, that in fact, a member of a rural area committee has had his home burgled, and this is outrageous. So apart from 
police presence. I wonder if there is hardware available, such as CCTV or other forms of technology that could help assist the work of um, village police. In relation to burglary in rural and remote areas, apart from inspection and patrol, we have other. We make other efforts. For example, on gathering intelligence, you may have heard of this: that sometimes you have burglars of the same clan um, from the mainland coming to commit burglary and once we receive intelligence we would uh, uh, stop them and that uh, the other side the other uh, side of our work is uh, publicity and public education for example we would advise villages to install CCTV we also have neighborhood watch programs for example if you find something strange, something untoward in your village, you should inform the police as quickly as possible. At the same time, we step up patrol. We do have village patrol teams. And on top of that, PTU officers would be deployed to villages to conduct patrols. And some police officers may act on intelligence and lay ambush to mount uh, operation. So we have these supporting measures to improve law and order in re remote areas. Mr. Stephen Ho would like to ask questions for the second round. You have two minutes. Just a simple follow up. I hope the Security Bureau will pay attention to illegal fishing. Now, because of the long standing problem. Um, some local fishermen are thinking of uh, setting up their own team to combat illegal fishing. Although they may have the uh, necessary courage, uh, they may not be fully equipped. And since you mentioned that you need to ensure we have a good business environment and enhance law abiding awareness in your paper, I'd like to remind. Secretary, that uh, you must not set this issue aside and accord it a low priority. Illegal fishing may cost lives in the end of the day. There are new ways of tackling uh, smuggling, so I hope you work on illegal fishing as well. Any response, Secretary? We note the concern of fishermen. We're going to step up effort with the AFCD. In terms of combating crime, please leave it with our law enforcement agencies. We don't want any complexities. We don't want any of our fishermen harmed. That's the end of this item. Thank you, Secretary, Permanent Secretary, and your team. Third item, we will invite the ICAC Commissioner to brief us on the CE's 2021 policy address. So, members, if you want to ask questions, please press the button. Uh, now, uh, let's wait for the commissioner to come in first. We have with us Mr. Simon Pei, Commissioner, Mr. Ricky Yao, Head of Operations. Mr. Ho Wai Chi, Director of Community Relations. Mr. Zhou Li, Director of Corruption Prevention. And Ms. Sally Kwan, Assistant Director of Administration of ICAC. Speaking notes of the Commissioner have been tabled. Please refer to the notes if necessary. And uh, let's wait till the commission is ready and will give us a briefing. Thank you, Chairman. Chairman members, I will give some salient points on the work report of the ICC submitted to the panel. 
In terms of the corruption situation in Hong Kong, it continues to be under control in the first eight months. The ICAC received 1,460 corruption complaints, excluding election complaints, which is 15 percent more than that of the same period in 2020. The increase was attributable to the rising number of complaints in the private sector as a result of gradually reviving economic activities amid the pandemic. At present, the total number of complaints are still slightly below the pre-pandemic level in 2019. The ICAC will continue to monitor different sectors and flexibly deploy resources to prevent corruption from taking place. Hong Kong is highly corruption-free and has always won international recognition. In World Competitiveness Yearbook 2021 published in June, by the IMD, the integrity ranking of Hong Kong rose from 12 last year to 8. The Corruption Perceptions Index released early this year by the Transparency International, Hong Kong's ranking also rose from the 5th to the 11th, which is the highest level since the launch of the index. Amid the political atmosphere full of tension in which Western governments and media attacks the rule of law in Hong Kong with every excuse, the rise in the above rankings by internationally renowned organizations are hard to come by. It reflects the ICAC's achievements in combating corruption as well as international liaison and publicity. Next are brief members on our work plan in the coming year. The ICAC has kick-started a two-year integrity promotion campaign for public bodies to assist public bodies in strengthening their integrity management system. It has also enhanced the sample codes of conduct for members and employees of public bodies. Last week on the 20th of October, we've organized an ethical leadership conference for senior executives of public bodies to promote clean corporate governance and ICAC's corruption prevention service. Over 80 organizations and 240 senior executives attended the conference. We will continue to deploy resources in areas of public concern relating to public safety and the public of coffers. Noting that a number of real railway, a new railway projects are in the pipeline for implementation, the ICAC will assist the MTRCO to strengthen the corruption prevention measures in various stages of the projects and organize regular integrity management training for MTRCO's project staff, consultants, and contractors in order to raise their corruption prevention capabilities and awareness. We will continue to collaborate with the SFC, the Financial Reporting Council, HKMA, and the Insurance Authority to bolster Hong Kong's status as an international financial center. In the end of last month, we signed a memorandum of understanding with FRC to enhance the enforcement capabilities of the two agencies in fighting corruption and market malpractice. We'll also prepare a new online practical guide and other training resources for the banking sector to enhance the professional ethics of banking practitioners and the integrity culture of the industry. The ICAC has recently taken a series of enforcement action to combat corruption in the construction industry arising from uh, taking bribes and job referrals. And the end of last month, together with the Development Bureau and the Construction Industry Council, we jointly launched an industry-wide integrity charter scheme to promote the integrity management system to private construction companies to enhance the level of integrity among practitioners. In fact, recently we prosecuted a number of subcontractors or the foreman of subcontractors. As the property management sector is more prone to corruption, the ICAC will continue to assist the Property Management Services Authority to enhance its internal control. We will assist licensed property management companies in implementing the Code of Conduct on Prevention of Corruption and a related Best Practice Guide. We will continue to closely monitor corruption risks arising from building renovation and maintenance subsidy scheme to prevent corruption and bid rigging in the process.
as young well for the insurance industry as you read in the news this morning we neutralized a syndicate um, which is active on ins insurance uh, premium scamming and will continue to proceed with event investigation. As young people do not have a full awareness and understanding of corruption and their law-abiding awareness is weak, the ICAC will further step up moral and civic education for young people. The ICAC incorporated messages of the rule of law, law-abidingness, honesty, reporting corruption, etc. into the regular integrity promotion and education programs tailored for young people of different developmental stages. From the academic year commencing in September 2021, we have implemented the iJunior program for primary schools comprising theme-based moral education, resources and training for teachers, as well as experiential learning activities for students to support school-based moral and civic education. The ICAC will also launch an all for integrity public engagement signature event, engaging members of ICAC Club in planning and organizing activities to mark the 20th anniversary of the ICAC Club. A new drama series, ICAC Investigators 2022, will be broadcast to promote the core values of property and making a joint effort in maintaining Hong Kong clean, fair, stable, and prosperous. Say we. On election, the ICAC's internal interdepartmental working group has made reference to the experience gained in the election committee subsector elections and formulated a comprehensive operation plan to uphold the fairness and integrity of the electrical general election and the chief executive election. Offices of the ICAC were deployed to observe the polling and counting procedures of the EC subsector elections on site. We are now analyzing our observations on the polling day and will advise the government on anti corruption measures if necessary. On enforcement, besides taking robust investigative action in respect of corrupt or legal or illegal conduct breaching the elections corrupt and illegal conduct ordinance, we also adopt a preventive and intervention approach by requesting social media platforms or websites to remove contents which might constitute offences of manipulating or undermining, undermining elections. Investigating officers will also be deployed to the polling stations on the polling day to take swift and effective actions in response to inquiries and complaints from members of the public. On education and publicity strategies, we will ensure that clean election messages are brought home to all stakeholders of the elections so as to reduce risk of corruption and manipulation in the electoral processes. As the scale of the electrical general election is much larger than that of the EC subsector elections, we will make manpower arrangements to cope with the need. The ICAC will continue to join forces with our overseas and mainland counterparts in combating graft and sharing experience and actively promote to the world Hong Kong's corruption, free environment and robust rule of law. We will also continue to organize online training courses for graft fighters overseas. The ICAC will strive to play a more active role in the Executive Committee of the International Association of Anti-Corruption Authorities to help the latter synergize the cooperation of various anti-corruption agencies in the world for meeting the requirements of the United Nations Convention Against Corruption and achieving the United Nations Sustainable Development Target to eliminate corruption by year 2030. Also, the ICAC has worked closely with the National Commission of Supervision, the Guangdong Provision, Provincial Commission of Supervision, and the Commission Against Corruption of Macau with the aim of establishing closer anti-corruption collaboration in the GBA. Together with the Shanghai Anti-Corruption Bureau, we have been providing anti-corruption consultation services for Hong Kong enterprises in Shanghai to promote a culture of integrity. Hong Kong has, has experienced much challenges in the past two years. The national security law and the improvements of the electoral system has ushered in a new phase of order, stability and prosperity. As the institution responsible for fighting corruption and promoting integrity, we will remain steadfast in this duty and march in unity with members of the public to preserve rule of law and a fair business environment in Hong Kong and strengthen our status as an international center for finance, aviation and maritime, logistics and trade. Thank you, Chair. So far, there are three members who have raised their hands. I will prolong the meeting appropriately. If there are any further members, please press the button. I will draw a line here. Mr. Tony, Mr. Tony Chair, four minutes. 
Chair, I would like to thank the Commissioner and members of the ICAC for their efforts in the past so that Hong Kong remains to be a largely corruption-free society. We are all grateful for your work. I hope you can keep up your keep up with your good work in the next year. Concerning the key measures in the past in the past year on building management, I'm the chairman of the Property Management Services Authority. I would like to thank the ICAC for your administrative support for our implementation of the Code of Conduct on Prevention of Corruption and the Re Related Best Practice Guide. In the building management industry, practitioners and building management companies have to be very alert about um, corruption risks. The Code of Conduct and the Best Practice Guide will definitely be of help. Besides practitioners and companies, I'm also concerned about owners' corporations. I wonder how the ICAC has been educating owners' corporation on corruption risk and best practices. To a certain extent, we have to pay attention to owners' corporations in terms of corruption risk. For practitioners and companies um, as well, well, sometimes um, people are authorized by owners' corporation to take care of the building's business. So there may be opportunity for corruption. Um, arising. So we have to tackle the situation as source. We have to educate um, stakeholders on um, corruption-free practices. Thank you, Chair. On mutual assistance organizations and um, owners' corporations, the ICCAC has been doing a lot and to help them. I would invite um, Mr. Ho Wai Chi, Director of Community Relations, to talk about it. The ICCAC has been in close touch with owners' corporations. We have regular education um, activities. We uh, would explain the ECIC, uh, the um, the anti-corruption uh, legislation to owners' corporations on the invitation, and we would um, explain to owners how they should declare the interest in owners' corporations' meetings. So education efforts has been ongoing. For the new licensing system for building management practitioners and the new regulatory regime, we will enhance um, explanation to uh, owners' corporations in the future. Chair, you said you uh, the director said um, ICAC would approach them only on invitation. Well, I think at least you should um, tell the owners' corporation about the basics. I think um, not every owners' corporation would know um, the basic knowledge. So I think you should um, make it mandatory for owner for owners to um, for owners to um, take your courses. Thank you. We will um, consider your views. Ms. Ines Young, in paragraph 5, the ICAC has kick-started kick a two-year integrity promotion campaign for public bodies. Resources will be allocated to um, projects. We will be focused on projects of public concern with a huge impact on public safety and the public coffer. And also, um, you will concentrate on projects of the MTRC. 
So how can you help um, public bodies to enhance uh, its anti-corruption efforts? Will you issue pamphlets to public bodies, or will you take initiative to uh, make random checks on tenderings of um, public projects to identify whether there is a price rigging? We always think that um, we uh, the tendering system lacks transparency. Projects, including consultancy reports, only approach the logical for funding after a tender is secured. So how can you improve transparency to prevent uh, tender rigging? Paragraph 9 about the building management. It is an area prone to corruption. Now, um, the Urban Renewal Authority has a, a mechanism to ensure propriety of tendering. So do you expect tender rigging will still be an issue in year 2021 to 22? With the new system, has the situation improved? Thank you. Commissioner. Ms. Young has asked three questions. On public bodies, we have attached high importance all along. There are lots of public bodies, and some has a huge establishment. Some public bodies receive a vast amount of public money. So we have been working with public bodies to compile anti-corruption reports. It is for reviewing the internal system, governance, and so on. We will step up our efforts in this regard in the next two years. We would like to tackle the issue at source and eliminate corruption risk beforehand. On tender rigging, in recent years, the situation has improved significantly. Later on, I will invite the um, director to talk about these, uh, the improvement. Tender rigging is related to building management. Building management is uh, one of the major uh, area of complaints. So uh, I would invite Mr. Yao to talk about the improvement. On Ms. Yong's uh, question in terms of law enforcement on complaints about building management, uh, it accounts for one about one third of complaints from the private sector. The ratio remains largely the same in recent years. However, there are only very few cases related to tender rigging, especially since the implementation of the new system. Um, offenders are deterred. Besides our investigative operation for specific cases with a risk of tender rigging, we would take precautions and approach the owner's operation and tell them there is a risk of tender rigging so that they can take appropriate actions, for example, enhancing supervision or even um, issuing tender anew. The um, system is a smart tender. Mr. Stephen Holt, thank you, Chairman. First of all, I thank the ICAC team. First of all, I need to declare that I'm a member of the Complaint Handling Committee. I thank the Commissioner for a detailed presentation of the work of the ICAC at his headquarters. I have every confidence in the ICAC's work. I understand that um, during particular periods, such as the electoral um, process, uh, they will have a dedicated uh, team to handle electoral matters. In the past, there was quite some political uh, turmoil in Hong Kong, and uh, very often calls will be made to the ICAC to make complaints. With improvement in our electoral system, I believe that uh, the political environment has changed, and the uh, issue should um, we should see some improvement. Well, the in an upcoming 
political election. I wonder if you could conduct a more thorough research to see if we can now effectively curb um, vexatious complaints because some members refer to uh, frivolous complaints and I think uh, if we could address this issue we could help save resources. Now in the new era are you able to um, properly deploy resources like Ms. Yunus Young referred to just now and also we busted uh, the insurance scam case today. In terms of the amount we see an increase in the amount of losses. It seems that the criminals are looking at bigger fries and they might even engage experts to find loopholes in our corruption prevention system. So in terms of um, technology-based crimes that may happen in the future. I wonder if you have uh, sufficient resources to hire extra manpower to tackle the issues. We attach great importance to these crimes. Now about tech crimes or innovative uh, modus operandi, we attach great importance and we closely monitor the situation. We also strive to take a preemptive action so that we can get hold of the technology before the criminals so that we're not lagging behind. I'll defer to my colleague, Mr. Yao, to explain uh, our strategy. Thank you for the question. We have two priorities in terms of our enforcement action. Apart from gathering of intelligence, we analyze each and every case as well to see if we can identify an emerging uh, modus operandi. Apart from investigative or invest uh, officers for investigation officers, we also have a forensic accounting section. We have forensic accountants. We also have um, colleagues responsible for uh, computer crimes. Well, at this day and age, we need these two kinds of technology to combat tech crimes. And we continue to enhance our professional skills so as to bust more complex crimes. Well, let me supplement. I understand you do have these two um, in departments in the ICAC, but then from the figures, they don't they don't tell us about the new crimes identified. So I think perhaps you should uh, think out of the box. Apart from these two departments, you should come up with more innovative ways to combat crime. I hope the ICAC will, uh, Commissioner will give us, uh, give our comments a thought. That's the end of item three. Item four, AOB. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank colleagues for supporting me and I thank the legal advisor and the secretariat as well. I wish you every success. Thank you. That's the end of today's meeting.